Chapter 30 of Historical Tales, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume 5, German, by Charles Morris. Chapter 30, Scenes from the Seven Years' War. The story of Frederick the Great is a story of incessant wars, wars against frightful odds, for all Europe was combined against him, and for seven years the Austrians, the French, the Russians, and the Swedes surrounded his realm with the bitter determination to crush him, if not to annihilate the Prussian kingdom. England alone was on his side. Russia had joined the coalition through anger of the Empress Elizabeth at Frederick's satire upon her licentious life. France had joined it through hostility to England. Austria had organized it from indignation at Frederick's lawless seizure of Silesia. The army raised to operate against Prussia numbered several hundred thousand men. For years Frederick fought them all single-handed, with a persistence, an energy, and a resolute rising under the weight of defeat that compelled the admiration even of his enemies, and in the end gave him victory over them all. To the rigid discipline of his troops, his own military genius, and his indomitable perseverance, he owed his final success and his well-earned epithet of the great. The story of battle, stirring as it is, is apt to grow monotonous, and we have perhaps inflicted too many battle scenes already upon our readers, though we have selected only such as had some particular feature of interest to enliven them. Out of Frederick's numerous battles we may be able to present some examples sufficiently diverse from the ordinary to render them worthy of classification under the title of the Romance of History. Let us go back to the 5th of November, 1757. On that date the army of Frederick lay in the vicinity of Rosbach, on the Saale, then occupied by a powerful French army. The Prussian commander, after vainly endeavouring to bring the Austrians to battle, had turned and marched against the French with the hope of driving them out of Saxony. His hope was not a very promising one. The French army was sixty thousand strong, he had but little over twenty thousand men. While he felt hope, the French felt assurance. They had their active foe now in their clutches, they deemed. With his handful of men he could not possibly stand before their onset. He had escaped them more than once before. This time they had him, as they believed. His camp was on a height near the Zale. Towards it the French advanced with flying colors and sounding trumpets, as if with purpose to strike terror into the ranks of their foes. That Frederick would venture to stand before them they scarcely credited. If he should, his danger would be imminent, for they had laid their plans to surround his small force, and by taking the king and his army pensioners, end at a blow the vexatious war. They calculated shrewdly, but not well, for they left Frederick out of the account in their plans. As they came up, line after line, column after column, they must have been surprised by the seeming indifference of the Prussians. They were in their ranks, no signs of retreat and none of hostility. They remained perfectly quiet in their camp, not a gun being fired, not a movement visible, as inert and heedless to all seeming of the coming of the French as though there were no enemy within a hundred miles. There was a marked difference between the make-up of the two armies, which greatly reduced their numerical odds. Frederick's army was composed of thoroughly disciplined and trained soldiers, every man of whom knew his place and his duty and could be trusted in an emergency. The French, on the contrary, had brought all they could of Paris with them. Their army was encumbered with women, wig-makers, barbers, and the like impedimenta, and confusion and gaiety in their ranks replaced the stern discipline of Frederick's camp. After the battle the booty is said to have consisted largely of objects of gallantry better suited for a boudoir than a camp. The light columns of smoke that arose from the Prussian camp as the French advanced indicated their occupation, and that by no means suggested alarm. They were cooking their dinners with as much unconcern as though they had not yet seen the coming enemy nor heard the clangor of trumpets that announced their approach. Had the French commanders been within the Prussian lines, they would have been more astonished still, for they would have seen Frederick with his staff and general officers, dining at leisure, and with the utmost coolness and indifference. There was no appearance of haste in their movements, and no more in those of their men, whose whole concern just then seemed to be the getting of a good meal. The hour passed on, the French came nearer, their trumpet clangor was close at hand. Every moment seemed to render the peril of the Prussians more imminent, yet their inertness continued. It looked almost as though they had given up the idea of defense. The confidence of the French must have grown rapidly, as their plan of surrounding the Prussians with their superior numbers seemed more and more assured. But Frederick had his eye upon them. He was biding his time. Suddenly there came a change. It was about half-past two in the afternoon. The French had reached the position for which he had been waiting. 
Quickly, the staff officers dashed right and left with their orders. The trumpets sounded. As if by magic the tents were struck, the men sprang to their ranks and were drawn up in battle array. The artillery opened its fire. The seeming inertness which had prevailed was with extraordinary rapidity exchanged for warlike activity. The complete discipline of the Prussian army had never been more notably displayed. The French, who had been marching forward with careless ease, beheld this change of the situation with astounded eyes. They looked for heaviness and slowness of movement among the Germans, and could scarcely believe in the possibility of such rapidity of evolution. But they had little time to think. The Prussian batteries were pouring a rain of balls through their columns, and quickly the Prussian cavalry, headed by the dashing sidelets, was in their midst, cutting and slashing with annihilating vigor. The surprise was complete. The French found it impossible to form into line. Everywhere their columns were being swept by musketry and artillery, and decimated by the sabres of the charging cavalry. In almost less time than it takes to tell it, they were thrown into confusion, overwhelmed, routed. In the course of less than half an hour the fate of the battle was decided, and the French army completely defeated. Their confidence of a short time before was succeeded by panic, and the lately trim ranks fled in utter disorganization, so utterly broken that many of the fugitives never stopped till they reached the other side of the Rhine. Ten thousand prisoners fell into Frederick's hands, including nine generals and numerous other officers, together with all the French artillery and twenty-two standards, while the victory was achieved with the loss of only one hundred and sixty-five killed and three hundred and fifty wounded on the Prussian side. The triumph was one of discipline against overconfidence. No army under less complete control than that of Frederick could have sprung so suddenly into warlike array. To this, and to the sudden and overwhelming dash of Zeidlitz and his cavalry, the remarkable victory was due. Just one month from that date, on the 5th of December, another great battle took place, and another important victory for Frederick the Great. With 34,000 Prussians he defeated 80,000 Austrians, while the prisoners taken nearly equaled in number his entire force. The Austrians had taken the opportunity of Frederick's campaign against the French to overrun Silesia. Breslau, its capital, with several other strongholds, fell into their hands, and the probability was that if left there during the winter they would so strongly fortify it as to defy any attempt of the Prussian king to recapture it. Despite the weakness of his army, Frederick decided to make an effort to regain the lost province, and marched at once against the Austrians. They lay in a strong position behind the river Lohe, and here their leader, feared Marshal Daun, wished to have them remain, having had abundant experience of his opponent in the field. This cautious advice was not taken by Prince Charles, who controlled the movements of the army, and whom several of the generals persuaded that it would be degrading for a victorious army to entrench itself against one so much inferior in numbers, and advised him to march out and meet the Prussians. The parade guard of Berlin, as they contemptuously designated Frederick's army, would never be able to make a stand against them. The prince, who was impetuous in disposition, agreed with them marched out from his entrenchments, and met Frederick's army in the vast plain near Leuten. On December 5th the two armies came face to face, the lines of the imperial force extending over a space of five miles, while those of Frederick occupied a much narrower space. In his lack of numbers the Prussian king was obliged to substitute celerity of movement, hoping to double the effectiveness of his troops by their quickness of action. The story of the battle may be given in a few words. A false attack was made on the Austrian right, and then the bulk of the Prussian army was hurled upon their left wing, with such impetuosity as to break and shatter it. The disorder caused by this attack spread until it included the whole army. In three hours' time Frederick had completely defeated his foes, one-third of whom were killed, wounded, or captured, and the remainder put to flight. The field was covered with the slain, and whole battalions surrendered, the Prussians capturing in all twenty-one thousand prisoners. They took besides one hundred and thirty cannon and three thousand baggage and ammunition wagons. The victory was a remarkable example of the supremacy of genius over mere numbers. Napoleon says of it, that battle was a masterpiece. Of itself it is sufficient to entitle Frederick to a place in the first rank of generals. It restored Silesia to the Prussian dominions. There is one more of Frederick's victories of sufficiently striking character to fit in with those already given. It took place in 1760, several years after those described, years in which Frederick had struggled persistently against overwhelming odds, and though often worsted, yet coming up fresh after every defeat and unconquerably keeping the field. He was again in Silesia, which was once more seriously threatened by the Austrian forces. His position was anything but a safe one. 
the Austrians almost surrounded him. On one side was the army of Field Marshal Daun, on the other that of General Lachy. In front was General Loudon. Fighting day and night, he advanced, and finally took up his position at Liegnitz, where he found his forward route blocked, Daun having formed a junction with Loudon. His magazines were at Breslau and Schweidnitz in front, which it was impossible to reach, while his brother, Prince Henry, who might have marched to his relief, was detained by the Russians on the Oder. The position of Frederick was a critical one. He had only a few days' supply of provisions. It was impossible to advance and dangerous to retreat. The Austrians, in superior numbers, were dangerously near him. Only fortune and valor could save him from serious disaster. In this crisis of his career happy chance came to his aid, and relieved him from the awkward and perilous situation into which he had fallen. The Austrians were keenly on the alert, biding their time and watchful for an opportunity to take the Prussians at advantage. The time had now arrived, as they thought, and they laid their plans accordingly. On the night before the 15th of August Loudon set out on a secret march, his purpose being to gain the heights of Puffendorf, from which the Prussians might be assailed in the rear. At the same time the other corps were to close in on every side, completely surrounding Frederick and annihilating him if possible. It was a well-laid and promising plan, but accident befriended the Prussian king. Accident and alertness, we may say, since to prevent a surprise from the Austrians he was in the habit of changing the location of his camp almost every night. Such a change took place on the night in question. On the 14th the Austrians had made a close reconnaissance of his position. Fearing some hostile purpose in this, Frederick, as soon as the night had fallen, ordered his tents to be struck and the camp to be moved with the utmost silence, so as to avoid giving the foe a hint of his purpose. As it chanced, the new camp was made on those very heights of Puffendorf, towards which Loudon was advancing, with equal care and secrecy. That there might be no suspicion of the Prussian movement, the watchfires were kept up in the old camp, peasants attending to them, while patrols of hussars cried out the challenge every quarter of an hour. The gleaming lights, the watch-cries of the sentinels, all indicated that the Prussian army was sleeping on its old ground, without suspicion of the overwhelming blow intended for it on the morrow. Meanwhile the king and his army had reached their new quarters, where the utmost caution and noiselessness was observed. The king, wrapped in his military cloak, had fallen asleep beside his watch-fire. Seaton, his valiant cavalry leader, and a few others of the principal officers being with him, Throughout the camp the greatest stillness prevailed, all noise having been forbidden. The soldiers slept with their arms close at hand and ready to be seized at a moment's notice. Frederick fully appreciated the peril of his situation and was not to be taken by surprise by his active foes. And thus the night moved on until midnight passed and the new day began its course in the small hours. About two o'clock a sudden change came in the situation. A horseman galloped at full speed through the camp and drew up hastily at the king's tent, calling Frederick from his light slumbers. He was the officer in command of the patrol of hussars, and brought startling news. The enemy was at hand, he said. His advance columns were within a few hundred yards of the camp. It was Loudon's army, seeking to steal into possession of those heights which Frederick had so opportunely occupied. The stirring tidings passed rapidly through the camp. The soldiers were awakened, the officers seized their arms and sprang to horse. The troops grasped their weapons and hastened into line. The cannoneers flew to their guns. Soon the roar of artillery warned the coming Austrians that they had a foe in their front. Loudon pushed on, thinking this to be some advance column which he could easily sweep from his front. Not until day dawned did he discover the true situation, and perceive with astounded eyes that the whole Prussian army stood in line of battle on those very heights which he had hoped so easily to occupy. The advantage on which the Austrian had so fully counted lay with the Prussian king. Yet undaunted, Loudon pushed on and made a vigorous attack, feeling sure that the thunder of the artillery would be borne to Down's ears, and bring that commander in all haste with his army to take part in the fray. But the good fortune which had so far favoured Frederick did not now desert him. The wind blew freshly in the opposite direction and carried the sound of the cannon away from Down's hearing. Not the roar of a piece of artillery came to him, and his army lay moveless during the battle, he deeming that Loudon must now be in full possession of the heights, and felicitating himself on the neat trap into which the King of Prussia had fallen. While he thus rested on his arms, glorying in his soul on the annihilation to which the pestilent Prussians were doomed, his ally was making a desperate struggle for life on those very heights which he counted on taking without a shot. Truly the Austrians had reckoned without their foe in laying their cunning plot. Three hours of daylight finished the affray. 
Taken by surprise as they were, the Austrians proved unable to sustain the vigorous Prussian assault, and were utterly routed, leaving ten thousand dead and wounded on the field, and eighty-two pieces of artillery in the enemy's hands. Shortly afterwards, Daun, advancing to carry out his share of the scheme of annihilation, fell upon the right wing of the Prussians, commanded by General Zieten, and was met with so fierce an artillery fire that he halted in dismay. And now news of Loudon's disaster was brought to him. Seeing that the game was lost and himself in danger, he emulated his associate in his hasty retreat. Fortune and alertness had saved the Prussian king from a serious danger and turned peril into victory. He lost no time in profiting by his advantage, and was in full march towards Breslau within three hours after the battle, the prisoners in the centre, the wounded, friend and foe alike, in wagons in the rear, and the captured cannon added to his own artillery train. Silesia was once more delivered into his hands. Never in history had there been so persistent and indomitable a resistance against overwhelming numbers as that which Frederick sustained for so many years against his numerous foes. At length, when hope seemed almost at an end, and it appeared as if nothing could save the Prussian kingdom from overthrow, death came to the aid of the courageous monarch. The Empress Elizabeth of Russia died, and Frederick's bitterest foe was removed. The new monarch, Peter the Third, was an ardent admirer of Frederick, and at once discharged all the Prussian prisoners in his hands and signed a treaty of alliance with Prussia. Sweden quickly did the same, leaving Frederick with no opponents but the Austrians. Four months more sufficed to bring his remaining foes to terms, and by the end of the year 1762 the distracting Seven Years' War was at an end, the indomitable Frederick remaining in full possession of Silesia, the great bone of contention in the war. His resolution and perseverance had raised Prussia to a high position among the kingdoms of Europe and laid the foundations of the present empire of Germany. End of chapter 30Chapter thirty one of Historical Tales, Volume five, German. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume five, German, by Charles Morris. Chapter thirty one The Patriots of the Tyrol. On the ninth of April, eighteen o nine, down the river Inn, in the Tyrol, came floating a series of planks from whose surface waved little red flags. What they meant, the Bavarian soldiers who held that mountain land with a hand of iron could not conjecture, but what they meant the peasantry well knew. On the day before, peace had ruled throughout the Alps, and no Bavarian dreamed of war. Those flags were the signal for insurrection, and on their appearance the brave mountaineers sprang at once to arms and flew to the defense of the bridges of their country, which the Bavarians were marching to destroy as an act of defense against the Austrians. On the 10th the storm of war burst. Some Bavarian sappers had been sent to blow up the bridge of St. Lorenzo, but hardly had they begun their work when a shower of bullets from unseen marksmen swept the bridge. Several were killed, the rest took flight. The Tyrol was in revolt. News of this outbreak was borne to Colonel Rede, in command of the Bavarians, who hastened with a force of infantry, cavalry, and artillery to the spot. He found the peasants out in numbers. The Tyrolean riflemen, who were accustomed to bring down chamois from the mountain peaks, defended the bridge and made terrible havoc in the Bavarian ranks. They seized Reda's artillery and flung guns and gunners together into the stream, and finally put the Bavarians to rout with severe loss. The Bavarians held the Tyrol as allies of the French, and the movement against the bridges had been directed by Napoleon to prevent the Austrians from reoccupying the country which had been wrested from their hands. Reda, in his retreat, was joined by a body of three thousand French, but decided, instead of venturing again to face the daring foe, to withdraw to Innsbruck. But withdrawal was not easy. The signal of revolt had everywhere called the Tyrolese to arms. The passes were occupied. The fine old Roman bridge over the Brenner at Laditch was blown up. In the pass of the Brixen, leading to this bridge, the French and Bavarians found themselves assailed in the old Swiss manner, by rocks and logs rolled down upon their heads, while the unerring rifles of the hidden peasants swept the pass. Numbers were slain, but the remainder succeeded in escaping by means of a temporary bridge, which they threw over the stream on the site of the bridge of Ladich. Of the Tyrolese patriots to whom this outbreak was due, two are worthy of special mention. Joseph Speckbacher, a wealthy peasant of Rhin, and the more famous Andrew Hoffer, the host of the Sand Inn at Passer, a man everywhere known through the mountains, as he traded in wine, corn, and horses as far as the Italian frontier. 
Hofer was a man of Herculean frame and of a full, open, handsome countenance, which gained dignity from its long, dark brown beard, which fell in rich curls upon his chest. His picturesque dress, that of the Tyrol, comprised a red waistcoat, crossed by green braces, which were fastened to black knee braces of chamois leather, below which he wore red stockings. A broad black leather girdle clasped his muscular form, while over all was worn a short green coat. On his head he wore a low, crowned, broad-brimmed Tyrolean hat, black in color, and ornamented with green ribbons and with the feathers of the Capricaiosi. The striking-looking patriot, at the head of a strong party of peasantry, made an assault early on the 11th upon a Bavarian infantry battalion under the command of Colonel Bereklau, who retreated to a tableland named Sterzinger Moos, where, drawn up in a square, he resisted every effort of the Tyrolese to dislodge him. Finally, Hofer broke his lines by a stratagem. A wagon loaded with hay and driven by a girl was pushed towards the square, the brave girl shouting as the balls flew around her, On with ye, who cares for Bavarian dumplings? Under its shelter the Tyrolese advanced, broke the square, and killed or made prisoners the whole of the battalion. Speckbacher, the other patriot named, was no less active. No sooner had the signal of revolt appeared in the inn than he set the alarm bells ringing in every church tower through the lower valley of that stream, and quickly was at the head of a band of stalwart Tyrolese. On the night of the eleventh he advanced on the city of Hull, and lighted about a hundred watchfires on one side of the city, as if about to attack it from that quarter. While the attention of the garrison was directed towards these fires, he crept through the darkness to the gate on the opposite side, and demanded entrance as a common traveller. The gate was opened, his hidden companions rushed forward and seized it. In a brief time the city, with its Bavarian garrison, was his. On the twelfth he appeared before Innsbruck and made a fierce assault upon the city, in which he was aided by a murderous fire poured upon the Bavarians by the citizens from the windows and towers. The people of the upper valley of the inn flocked to the aid of their fellows, and the place, with its garrison, was soon taken, despite their obstinate defence. Ditfurt, the Bavarian leader, who scornfully refused to yield to the peasant dogs, as he considered them, fought with tiger-like ferocity, and fell at length, pierced by four bullets. One further act completed the freeing of the Tyrol from Bavarian domination. The troops under Colonel Rede had, as we have related, crossed the Brenner on a temporary bridge and escaped the perils of the pass. Greater perils awaited them. Their road lay past Sterzing, the scene of Hofer's victory. Every trace of the conflict had been obliterated, and Rede vainly sought to discover what had become of Bereklau and his battalion. He entered the narrow pass through which the road ran at that place and speedily found his ranks decimated by the rifles of Hofer's concealed men. After considerable loss, the column broke through and continued its march to Innsbruck, where it was immediately surrounded by a triumphant host of Tyrolese. The struggle was short, sharp, and decisive. In a few minutes several hundred men had fallen. In order to escape complete destruction, the rest laid down their arms. The captors entered Innsbruck in triumph, preceded by the military band of the enemy, which they compelled to play, and guarding their prisoners, who included two generals, more than a hundred other officers, and about two thousand men. In two days the Tyrol had been freed from its Bavarian oppressors and their French allies, and restored to its Austrian lords. The arms of Bavaria were everywhere cast to the ground, and the officials removed. But the prisoners were treated with great humanity, except in the single instance of a tax-gatherer who had boasted that he would grind down the Tyrolese until they should gladly eat hay. In revenge they forced him to swallow a bushel of hay for his dinner. The freedom thus gained by the Tyrolese was not likely to be permanent with Napoleon for their foe. The Austrians hastened to the defense of the country which had been so bravely won for their emperor. On the other side came the French and Bavarians as enemies and oppressors. Lefebvre, the leader of the invaders, was a rough and brutal soldier, who encouraged his men to commit every outrage upon the mountaineers. For some two or three months the conflict went on, with varying fortunes, depending upon the conditions of the war between France and Austria. At first the French were triumphant, and the Austrians withdrew from the Tyrol. Then came Napoleon's defeat at Aspern, and the Tyrolese rose and again drove the invaders from their country. In July occurred Napoleon's great victory at Wagram, and the hopes of the Tyrol once more sank. All the Austrians were withdrawn, and Lefebvre again advanced at the head of thirty or forty thousand French, Bavarians, and Saxons. The courage of the peasantry vanished before this threatening invasion. Hofer alone remained resolute, saying to the Austrian governor on his departure, 
Well, then, I will undertake the government, and as long as God wills, name myself Andrew Hoffer, host of the Sand at Passer, and Count of the Tyrol. He needed resolution, for his fellow chiefs deserted the cause of their country on all sides. On his way to his home he met Speckbacher, hurrying from the country in a carriage with some Austrian officers. "'Wilt thou also desert thy country?' said Hoffer to him, in tones of sad reproach. Another leader, Joachim Haspinger, a Capuchin monk, nicknamed Redbeard, a man of much military talent, withdrew to his monastery at Zeven. Hoffer was left alone of the Tyrolese leaders. While the French advanced without opposition, he took refuge in a cavern amid the steep rocks that overhung his native vale, where he implored heaven for aid. The aid came. Lefebvre, in his brutal fashion, plundered and burnt as he advanced, and published a prescription list instead of the amnesty promised. The natural result followed. Hofer persuaded the bold Capuchin to leave his monastery, and he, with two others, called the western Tyrol to arms. Hofer raised the eastern Tyrol. They soon gained a powerful associate in Speckbacher, who, conscience-stricken by Hofer's reproach, had left the Austrians and hastened back to his country. The invader's cruelty had produced its natural result. The Tyrol was once more in full revolt. With a bunch of rosemary, the gift of their chosen maidens in their green hats, the young men grasped their trusted rifles and hurried to the places of rendezvous. The older men wore peacock plumes, the Habsburg symbol. With haste they prepared for the war. Cannon, which did good service, were made from board logs of larch wood bound with iron rings. Here the patriots built abatis. There they gathered heaps of stone on the edges of precipices which rose above the narrow vales and passes. The timber slides in the mountains were changed in their course, so that trees from the heights might be shot down upon the important passes and bridges. All that could be done to give the invaders a warm welcome was prepared, and the bold peasants waited eagerly for the coming conflict. From four quarters the invasion came, Lefebvre's army being divided so as to attack the Tyrolese from every side, and meet in the heart of the country. They were destined to a disastrous repulse. The Saxons, led by Rouillet, marched through the narrow valley of Eisach, the heights above which were occupied by Haspinger the Capuchin and his men. Down upon them came rocks and trees from the heights. Rouillet was hurt, and many of his men were slain around him. He withdrew in haste, leaving one regiment to retain its position in the Oberau. This the Tyrolese did not propose to permit. They attacked the regiment on the next day in the narrow valley with overpowering numbers. Though faint with hunger and the intense heat, and exhausted by the fierceness of the assault, a part of the troops cut their way through with great loss and escaped. The rest were made prisoners. The story is told that during their retreat, and when ready to drop with fatigue, the soldiers found a cask of wine. Its head was knocked in by a drummer, who, as he stooped to drink, was pierced by a bullet, and his blood mingled with the wine. Despite this, the famishing soldiery greedily swallowed the contents of the cask. A second corps d'armée advanced up the valley of the inn as far as the bridges of Prus. Here it was repulsed by the Tyrolese and retreated under cover of the darkness during the night of August 8th. The infantry crept noiselessly over the bridge of Pontlatz. The cavalry followed with equal caution but with less success. The sound of a horse's hoof aroused the watchful Tyrolese. Instantly rocks and trees were hurled upon the bridge, men and horses being crushed beneath them and the passage blocked. All the troops which had not crossed were taken prisoners. The remainder were sharply pursued, and only a handful of them escaped. The other divisions of the invading army met with a similar fate. Lefebvre himself, who reproached the Saxons for their defeat, was not able to advance as far as they, and was quickly driven from the mountains with greatly thinned ranks. He was forced to disguise himself as a common soldier and hide among the cavalry to escape the balls of the sharpshooters who owed him no love. The rear guard was attacked with clubs by the Capuchin and his men, and driven out with heavy loss. During the night that followed, all the mountains around the beautiful valley of Innsbruck were lit up with watchfires. In the valley below, those of the invaders were kept brightly burning, while the troops silently withdrew. On the next day the Tyrol held no foes. The invasion had failed. Hofer placed himself at the head of government at Innsbruck, where he lived in his old simple mode of life proclaimed some excellent laws, and convoked a national assembly. The Emperor of Austria sent him a golden chain and three thousand ducats. He received them with no show of pride, and returned the following naive answer. Sirs, I thank you. I have no news for you to-day. I have, it is true, three couriers on the road, the Vacha Hisele, the Sixten Sebele, 
and the Mimme de France, and the Schwanz ought long to have been here. I expect the rascal every hour. Meanwhile, Speckbacher and the Capuchin kept up hostilities successfully on the eastern frontier. Haspinger wished to invade the country of their foes, but was restrained by his more prudent associate. Speckbacher is described as an open-hearted, fine-spirited fellow, with the strength of a giant and the best marksman in the country. So keen was his vision that he could distinguish the bells on the necks of the cattle at the distance of half a mile. His son, Andela, but ten years of age, was of a spirit equal to his own. In one of the earlier battles of the war he had occupied himself during the fight in collecting the enemy's balls in his hat, and so obstinately refused to quit the field that his father had him carried by force to a distant alp. During the present conflict Andele unexpectedly appeared and fought by his father's side. He had escaped from his mountain retreat. It proved an unlucky escape. Shortly afterwards the father was surprised by treachery and found himself surrounded with foes, who tore from him his arms, flung him to the ground, and seriously injured him with blows from a club. But in an instant more he sprang furiously to his feet, hurled his assailants to the earth, and escaped across a wall of rock, impassable except to an expert mountaineer. A hundred of his men followed him, but his young son was taken captive by his foes. The king, Maximilian Joseph, attracted by the story of his courage and beauty, sent for him and had him well educated. The freedom of the Tyrol was not to last long. The Treaty of Vienna between the emperors of Austria and France was signed. It did not even mention the Tyrol. It was a tacit understanding that the mountain country was to be restored to Bavaria, and to reduce it to obedience three fresh armies crossed its frontiers. They were repulsed in the south, but in the north, Hoffe, under unwise advice, abandoned the interior passes, and the invaders made their way as far as Innsbruck, whence they summoned him to capitulate. During the night of October 30th, an envoy from Austria appeared in the Tyrolese camp, bearing a letter from the Archduke John, in which he announced the conclusion of peace and commanded the mountaineers to disperse, and not to offer their lives as a useless sacrifice. The Tyrolese regarded him as their lord and obeyed, though with bitter regret. A dispersion took place except of the band of Spechbacher, which held its ground against the enemy till the 3rd of November, when he received a letter from Hofer saying, I announce to you that Austria has made peace with France and has forgotten the Tyrol. On receiving this news he disbanded his followers and all opposition ceased. The war was soon afoot again, however, in the native vale of Hofer, the people of which, made desperate by the depredations of the Italian bands which had penetrated their country, sprang to arms and resolved to defend themselves to the bitter end. They compelled Hofer to place himself at their head. For a time they were successful, but a traitor guided the enemy to their rear, and defeat followed. Hofer escaped and took refuge among the mountain peaks. Others of the leaders were taken and executed. The most gallant among the peasantry were shot or hanged. There was some further opposition, but the invaders pressed into every valley, and disarmed the people, the bulk of whom obeyed the orders given them and offered no resistance. The revolt was quelled. Hofer took refuge at first with his wife and child, in a narrow hollow in the Kellerlager. This he soon left for a hut on the highest Alps. He was implored to leave the country, but he vowed that he would live or die on his native soil. Discovery soon came. A peasant named Raffel learned the location of his hiding-place by seeing the smoke ascend from his distant hut. He foolishly boasted of his knowledge. His story came to the ears of the French. He was arrested and compelled to guide them to the spot. Two thousand French were spread around the mountain. A thousand six hundred ascended it. Hofer was taken. His captors treated him with brutal violence. They tore out his beard and dragged him pinioned, barefoot, and in his nightdress over ice and snow to the valley. Here he was placed in a carriage and carried to the fortress of Mantua in Italy. Napoleon, on news of the capture being brought to him at Paris, sent orders to shoot him within twenty-four hours. He died as bravely as he had lived. When placed before the firing party of twelve riflemen, he refused either to kneel or to allow himself to be blindfolded. I stand before my creator, he exclaimed in firm tones, and standing will I restore to him the spirit he gave. He gave the signal to fire, but the men, moved by the scene, missed their aim. The first fire brought him to his knees, the second stretched him on the ground, where a corporal terminated the cruel scene by shooting him through the head. He died February twentieth, 1810. At a later date his remains were borne back to his native Alps. A handsome monument of white marble was erected to his memory in the church at Innsbruck, and his family was ennobled. 
of the two other principal leaders of the Tyrolese, Haspinger the Capuchin, escaped to Vienna, which Spechbacher also succeeded in reaching, after a series of perils and escapes which are well worth relating. After the dispersal of his troops, he, like Hofer, sought concealment in the mountains, where the Bavarians sought for him in troops, vowing to cut his skin into bootstraps if they caught him. He attempted to follow the mountain paths to Austria, but at Dux found the roads so blocked with snow that further progress was impossible. Here the Bavarians came upon his track and attacked the house in which he had taken refuge. He escaped by leaping from its roof, but was wounded in doing so. For the twenty-seven days that followed he roamed through the snowy mountain forests, in danger of death both from cold and starvation. Once for four days together he did not taste food. At the end of this time he found shelter in a hut at Boulderberg, where by chance he found his wife and children, who had sought the same asylum. His bitterly persistent foes left him not long in safety here. They learned his place of retreat and pursued him, his presence of mind alone saving him from capture. Seeing them approach, he took a sledge upon his shoulders and walked towards and past them as though he were a servant of the house. His next place of refuge was in a cave on the Gemshaken, in which he remained until the opening of spring, when he had the ill fortune to be carried by a snow-slide a mile and a half into the valley. It was impossible to return. He crept from the snow, but found that one of his legs was dislocated. The utmost he could do, and that, with agonizing pain, was to drag himself to a neighboring hut. Here were two men who carried him to his own house at Rin. Bavarians were quartered in the house, and the only place of refuge open to him was the cow-shed, where his faithful servant Doppel dug for him a hole beneath the bed of one of the cows, and daily supplied him with food. His wife had returned to the house, but the danger of discovery was so great that even she was not told of his propinquity. For seven weeks he remained, thus half buried in the cow-shed, gradually recovering his strength. At the end of that time he rose, bade adieu to his wife, who now first learned of his presence, and again betook himself to the high paths of the mountains from which the sun of May had freed the snow. He reached Vienna without further trouble. Here the brave patriot received no thanks for his services. Even a small estate he had purchased with the remains of his property he was forced to relinquish, not being able to complete the purchase. He would have been reduced to beggary, but for Hofer's son, who had received a fine estate from the emperor, and who engaged him as his steward. Thus ended the active career of the ablest leader in the Tyrolean War. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of Historical Tales, Volume Five, German. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Historical Tales, Volume Five, German by Charles Morris. Chapter Thirty Two: The Old Empire and the New. During the Christmas festival of the year eight hundred, the crown of the imperial dignity was placed at Rome on the head of Charles the Great and the Roman Empire of the West again came into being, so far as a dead thing could be restored to life. For one thousand and six hundred years afterwards this title of emperor was retained in Germany, though the power represented by it became at times a very shadowy affair. The authority and influence of the emperors reached their culmination during the reign of the Hohenstaufens, 1138 to 1254. For a few centuries afterwards the title represented an empire which was but a quarter fact, three quarters tradition, the emperor being duly elected by the diet of German princes, but by no means submissively obeyed. The fraction of fact which remained of the old empire perished in the Thirty Years' War. After that date the title continued in existence, being held by the Habsburgs of Austria as an hereditary dignity, but the empire had vanished except as a tradition or superstition. Finally, on the 6th of August, 1806, Francis II, at the absolute dictum of Napoleon, laid down the title of Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, and the long-defunct empire was finally buried. The shadow which remained of the empire of Charlemagne had vanished before the rise of a greater and more vital thing, the empire of France, brought into existence by the genius of Napoleon Bonaparte, successor of Charles the Great as a mighty conqueror. For a few years it seemed as if the original empire might be restored. The power of Napoleon indeed extended farther than that of his great predecessor, all Europe west of Russia becoming virtually his. Some of the kings were replaced by monarchs of his creation, others were left upon their thrones but with their power shorn, their dignity being largely one of vassalage to France. 
not content with an empire that stretched beyond the limits of that of Charlemagne or of the Roman Empire of the West, Napoleon ambitiously sought to subdue all Europe to his imperial will, and marched into Russia with nearly all the remaining nations of Europe as his forced allies. His career as a conqueror ended in the snows of Muscovy and amid the flames of Moscow. The shattered fragment of the grand army of conquest that came back from that terrible expedition found crushed and dismayed Germany, rising into hostile vitality in its rear. Russia pursued its vanquished invader, Prussia rose against him, Austria joined his foes, and at length, in October 1813, united Germany was marshalled in arms against its mighty enemy before the city of Leipzig, the scene of the great battles of the Thirty Years' War nearly two centuries before. Here was fought one of the fiercest and most decisive struggles of that quarter-century of conflict. It was a fight for life, a battle to decide the question of who should be lord of Europe. Napoleon had been brought to bay. Despising to the last his foes, he had weakened his army by leaving strong garrisons in the German cities, which he hoped to reoccupy after he had beaten the German armies. On the 16th of October the great contest began. It was fought fiercely throughout the day with successive waves of victory and defeat, the advantage at the end resting with the Allies through sheer force of numbers. The 17th was a day of rest and negotiation, Napoleon vainly seeking to induce the Emperor of Austria to withdraw from the alliance. While this was going on, large bodies of Swedes, Russians, and Austrians were marching to join the German ranks, and the Battle of the 18th was fought between a 150,000 French and a hostile army of double that strength, which represented all northern and eastern Europe. The battle was one of frightful slaughter. Its turning point came when the Saxon infantry, which had hitherto fought on the French side, deserted Napoleon's cause in the thick of the fight and went over in a body to the enemy. It was an act of treachery whose fatal effect no effort could overcome. The day ended with victory in the hands of the Allies. The French were driven back close upon the walls of Leipzig, with the serried columns of Germany and Russia closing them in, and bent upon giving no relaxation to their desperate foe. The struggle was at an end. Longer resistance would have been madness. Napoleon ordered a retreat. But the Elster had to be crossed, and only a single bridge remained for the passage of the army and its stores. All night long the French poured across the bridge with what they could take of their wagons and guns. Morning dawned with the rush and hurry of the retreat still in active progress. A strong rear guard held the town, and Napoleon himself made his way across the bridge with difficulty through the crowding masses. Hardly had he crossed when a frightful misfortune occurred. The bridge had been mined to blow it up on the approach of the foe. This duty had been carelessly trusted to a subaltern, who, frightened by seeing some of the enemy on the riverside, set fire hastily to the train. The bridge blew up with a tremendous explosion, leaving a rear guard of twenty-five thousand men in Leipzig cut off from all hope of escape. Some officers plunged on horseback into the stream and swam across. Prince Poniatowski, the gallant Pole, essayed the same, but perished in the attempt. The soldiers of the rear guard were forced to surrender as prisoners of war. In this great conflict, which continued for four days, and in which the most of the nations of Europe took part, eighty thousand men are said to have been slain. The French lost very heavily in prisoners and guns. Only a hasty retreat to the Rhine saved the remainder of their army from being cut off and captured. On the 20th, Napoleon succeeded in crossing that frontier river of his kingdom with seventy thousand men, the remnant of the grand army with which he had sought to hold Prussia after the disastrous end of the invasion of Russia. Germany was at length freed from its mighty foe. The garrisons which had been left in its cities were forced to surrender as prisoners of war. France, in its turn, was invaded, Paris taken, and Napoleon forced to resign the imperial crown and to retire from his empire to the little island of Elba near the Italian coast. In 1815 he returned, again set Europe in flame with war, and fell once more at Waterloo to end his career in the far-off island of St. Helena. Thus ended the empire founded by the great conqueror. The next to claim the imperial title was Louis Napoleon, who in 1851 had himself crowned as Napoleon III. But his so-called empire was confined to France, and fell in 1870 on the field of Sedan, himself and his army being taken prisoners. A republic was declared in France, and the second French empire was at an end. And now the empire of Germany was restored, after having ceased to exist for sixty-five years. The remarkable success of William of Prussia gave rise to a widespread feeling in the German states that he should assume the imperial crown, and the old empire be brought again into existence under new conditions, 
no longer hampered by the tradition of a Roman Empire, but as the title of United Germany. On December 18, 1870, an address from the North German Parliament was read to King William at Versailles, asking him to accept the imperial crown. He assented, and on January 18, 1871, an imposing ceremony was held in the splendid mirror hall, Galerie des Glaces, of Louis XIV at the royal palace of Versailles. The day was a wet one, and the king rode from his quarters in the prefecture to the great gates of the chateau, where he alighted and passed through a lane of soldiers, the roar of cannon heralding his approach, and rich strains of music signalling his entrance to the hall. William wore a general's uniform with the ribbon of the black eagle on his breast. Helmet in hand, he advanced slowly to the dais, bowed to the assembled clergymen, and turned to survey the scene. There had been erected an altar covered with scarlet cloth, which bore the device of the iron cross. Right and left of it were soldiers bearing the standards of their regiments. Attending on the king were the crown prince, and a brilliant array of the princes, dukes, and other rulers of the German states arranged in semicircular form. Just above his head was a great allegorical painting of the grand monarch with the proud subscription, Le roi gouverne par lui-même, the motto of the autocrat. The ceremony began with the singing of psalms, a short sermon, and a grand German chorale in which all present joined. Then William, in a loud but broken voice, read a paper in which he declared the German Empire re-established and the imperial dignity revived, to be invested in him and his descendants for all future time in accordance with the will of the German people. Count Bismarck followed with a proclamation addressed by the emperor to the German nation. As he ended, the Grand Duke of Baden, William's son-in-law, stepped out from the line, raised his helmet in the air, and shouted in stentorian tones, Long live the German Emperor William! Hurrah! Loud cheers and waving of swords and helmets responded to his stirring appeal. The Crown Prince fell on his knee to kiss the Emperor's hand, and a military band outside the hall struck up the German national anthem, while, as a warlike background to the scene, came the roar of French cannon from Mount Valerien still besieged by the Germans, their warlike peal the last note of defiance from vanquished France. Ten days afterwards Paris surrendered, and the war was at an end. On the 16th of June the army made a triumphant entrance into Berlin, William riding at its head, to be triumphantly hailed as emperor by his own people on his own soil. All Germany, with the exception of Austria, was for the first time fully united into an empire, the minor princes having ceased to exist as ruling potentates. End of chapter 32 End of Historical Tales, Volume 5, German, by Charles Morris